there are a lot of budget cards with strange releases, but nothing has surprised me more than a strange AMD budget card that has flown under the radar, so much so that you can pick one up for just £5. Now this right here is meant to be my Radeon R7 450, which I purchased from CEX for around £5. They did for some strange reason have it listed as an ATI Radeon, but that's an easy mistake to make and honestly that's the reason I bought it because it had a funny name. These things are relatively common around this price point, with most of them on eBay being around 5 to £10 and similar prices over on AliExpress, which should apply to sort of most of the world price wise making this one of the cheapest, newer graphics cards on the market. There are of course a couple of odd listings out there asking a few thousand pounds, but you can mostly end up ignoring these. I took a chance of not knowing what version I would actually get from CEX as they just had a generic picture on there, and I ended up with this version here. This looks to be an OEM version of the card, sold by Dell. There were a few other vendors that made them, but chances are if you order them, you will probably get one of these small form factor cards. It's not exciting to look at, but then again, why would it be? These cards are cheap, and at no point has anyone ever been talking about these, when they released, or even here today. So is it the budget bargain we all need? Well, yes and no, because despite some boring looks, and trust me, I thought this thing was going to be boring as well, it has a rather interesting history. And I thought we were just going to be installing a new OEM card and just testing it for some benchmarks, but nope, this thing has history. So while we get this all installed, just what is the R7 450, and why have none of us ever heard about this thing? Despite claims it released in 2016, this thing never actually saw any use in computers until around 2017, with it seeming to become one of the options on OEM systems like Dell's and HP's and a few other smaller vendors, and with the launch of the RX 400 series, now that would make sense. But even then, the number of these things produced doesn't seem to have reached its peak until around 2018 through to about 2020 and 2021, with them finally being removed from the market in 2022. So that makes this card relatively modern, correct? Well, no. See, the AMD 400 series from AMD is one that is fraught with confusion. If you thought it was confusing that the RX 480, the RX 580 and the RX 590 are more or less the same card with some minor alterations at the end, then the low end is even worse. See, the R7 450 isn't even the same architecture as any of these. No, it's not based on Polaris, it's based on an architecture from 2012. But it's not even that simple. See, this chip started as the legendary HD7750, which was around sort of 2012 era and just before the Xbox One came out and had a good reputation for itself, which was then given boosted clocks and re-released as the HD8740, which then got clocked down and became the R7250, which was then given boosted clocks again and renamed the R9255, which then became the R7350, and then logically you would think that this chip became the aptly named R7450. Well, no, it got some slightly higher clocks again and 4GB of VRAM bolted on and became the R9360M, which was mostly used in laptops which was then finally repurposed again over on desktop as the R7 450. So to recap, this card is a re-release of a rebrand that made its way into laptops and then made its way back to desktop, which is why absolutely no one is talking about it. Because by the time these things had left the market, it was based on a ludicrously souped up version of a card that came to the market 10 years ago and was chopped and changed about more than most cards ever are. And because of this, I really didn't expect much. But they pushed this architecture far beyond what I ever assumed it could do and beyond what it ever should reasonably do. No one should have been using Cape Verde Pro back in 2022 when they were still selling these things, yet here we are, with a boosted up version of the HD7750 in its final form. Drivers wise, that's probably the reason they stopped selling these, as driver support was dropped the year they stopped offering them as an OEM option back in 2022. So it even has recent drivers, 
It's also worth noting that the car does actually detect itself as an R7 450 once drivers are installed, as only the 2015 and 2016 release of the drivers detect the card as a mobile variant. And that's simply because this version of the card didn't exist yet, so Windows assumes you're using an R9 360M over on desktop because that's what it's based off. But once everything was installed, there weren't any issues, and when I went to do anything, it just seemed to work. But even being based on a 10 year old chip, this thing was relatively beefed up. So, what are the specs of AMD's mysterious R7 450? Released officially in 2016, but reaching its peak towards the end of the decade in 2020, the R7 450 boasts itself as one of the best specifications I've ever seen on a small OEM card. The card comes based on the Cape Verde Pro architecture, usually just revered for AMD Fire Pro chips, and the card has been boosted up to a 4GB of GDDR-based VRAM which is absolutely insane for a small card like this. Usually anything over 1GB in these cards was dropped down to incredibly slow DDR3 based RAM. But no, weirdly, you get 4GB of actual graphics capable memory. It also has higher clocks than any other release of the chip, with it being around 925MHz on HP cards, and even around 975MHz on the Dell examples. But this does come at a cost. See, although it's got a small form factor, these things can use up to 60 watts of power, around 58 watts from my testing. But even then, it's cheap, it's convenient, and it costs next to nothing. So let's get back to using it. I did attempt to do some overclocking on the card, given that these are the final Cape Verde chips from AMD and were often used in Fire Pros which can clock quite high, but these things are already clocked so high from the factory that you can't really budge things too much higher. The memory on the chip was unstable at virtually anything higher than its stock speeds, but on the core we did manage to actually get a slight overclock to 1055 megs on the core, which was the highest it would go before crashing. But for those of you with keen eyes, you can probably see the temperatures there. And well, they didn't change depending on if you ran it stock or with our tiny overclock. But I am so used to these cards running cool that I assumed it was just dried out thermal paste. I mean, there's a chance this could be one from 2016 and maybe the thermal paste has dried out or someone's changed it poorly. But nope, I took the card outside and the thermal paste looked brand new. I mean, this specific card we're using today has a date on it from 2021, so it should be fine. It just means that these things, well, they run hot, and they've given this card all of these upgrades, but the cooling solution on these is worse than ever. There's no copper or anything going on here. It is a small OEM aluminium heatsink. 92 degrees is where it peaks out with an overclock, and 91 degrees is where it peaks out stock. It stays stable and doesn't throttle, but these things run hot. I mean, the coolers that used to come on the R7250 and the HD7750, you had people making dual slot coolers. I mean, they were pointless because it completely defeated the point of those cards, but still, it was a better cooling solution than a tiny bit of metal slammed on top when you've given it all these upgrades. We are testing things today with a Ryzen 3 3100, which is more than capable of handling this graphics card. We also have 48GB of DDR4 RAM, so the only limit today is going to be the performance of AMD's R7 450. In some of the most surprising results I have seen from a cheap graphics card in a while, so please enjoy the benchmarks. Starting off the benchmarks, we have GTA 5 running in 1050p with high settings, where we saw a near enough flawless 60fps. We are filming the screen today rather than capturing it, as unfortunately I didn't have a DisplayPort adapter that would work fine with my capture card, so we're just filming the screen and you're seeing exactly what I'm seeing. Either way, it ran flawlessly with perfect utilisation, and with 4GB of memory we were able to have some of the more intensive options turned up which usually on cards like the HD 7750 we aren't able to do. In fact here we are seeing this thing beat out cards that are on paper a tier above it, cards like the HD 7770 and cards on that sort of tier. Maybe not in terms of overall grunt, but with exceptionally decent frame times. Overall for a card that will work in any system, not a bad showing. Although the card did run hot here but there wasn't any thermal throttling, as I think these things start to thermally throttle at about 98 degrees, so you're absolutely fine to enjoy games like this on the R7 450. 
the same thing did extend over to GTA Online, which people do like to see tested separately, which did run slightly worse, but we were in a relatively large lobby, over 16 players. Even then, the game was still fully playable, but GTA did its usual thing, where when in a big lobby, it drops the utilisation of a card. Even then, this was in no way worse than usual, and to be expected at this point, one day I'll do a full video covering this performance anomaly, but then again, good frame times, a decent average, and things looked great. So there's no real complaints for a card that is just a beefed up unit from over a decade ago, and actually came out before this game released on PC. In fact, it came out before this game even existed. BeamNG started off really strong, with the game running at our monitor's native resolution and a medium preset. We saw a pretty constant 30fps on our usual benchmark, which could go even higher up to 60fps on some of the simpler maps, and it didn't matter too much what you were doing, you'd see performance like this a lot of the time. It was one of the instances though where you really didn't need 4GB of VRAM and it seemed a bit overkill on a card like this, as you'd long since run out of power from the card before you could use it, especially on some of the more complex maps where you would max out the VRAM but you would see completely unplayable performance. So we did have to turn the game down to low settings, not the lowest keep in mind, so things ticked along slightly smoother. It didn't really matter what you were doing, as long as you didn't mind tweaking those settings around, BeamNG also runs fine on this little R7 card. Red Dead Redemption 2 ran into some strange issues, where the game doesn't even accept that the R7 450 is a real card, and despite us having a huge amount of VRAM, the game says we have none. This is the case for all drivers available for the card, except the ones where it calls it the R9360M, because it will let you use the VRAM then, and for all intents and purposes that card exists, but then the game runs awfully, because those drivers are from 2015. But with the latest ones, if you did go through and tweak the game manually using the config file, the game runs absolutely fine with lower settings in a 720p high definition resolution with a pretty fluent 30fps. The 4GB of VRAM did do a lot of heavy lifting here, as I've never seen such a low tier AMD card handle this game so well. I mean it makes sense why they were offering it in 2022, because with the sheer amount of memory and the high clocks this thing has, you have just enough grunt to run the games. You do have to fight the settings menu for not letting you choose how you want to run your game, but that's probably an AMD issue more than it is a Rockstar issue, so Red Dead Redemption is playable on a £5 graphics card. Mountain Blade 2 Banner Lord took a while to configure as the game ran very similar with low settings as it did with some of the higher ones. Eventually, we tweaked the game to look fairly decent with a mixture of low and medium settings, and we even managed to push shadows up to high, as they made no difference to our performance. In the end, throughout the built-in benchmark and one of our own large-scale battle benchmarks, we saw the game run perfectly fine with a playable 35fps average, which makes sense as that's what the game sort of targets over on consoles, and they use a slightly better version of this chip but don't have the VRAM, it's all complex, it doesn't really matter so it worked pretty good. During a lot of the early to mid game you could see 60fps in a lot of places, but for the late game and our benchmark, you'll be seeing closer to the high 30s. Edition also ran alright, with a mixture of medium and high settings in 1050p. The game wouldn't want to go much higher than this, as we started losing frames when you did go higher, but when you turn things down to low, they also didn't get much better. It's one of those times where this game just seems to run best at a nice and stable 30fps, with enough things turned up to pack out the VRAM, but nothing too high to cause the card to sort of suffer. You are playing a bit of a balancing act here. You could, you know, get higher frames than this when you weren't causing chaos in a town, so caves and out in the open and all those things, but generally when things got intense, you could definitely see a perfectly playable experience, which isn't too bad for a card that's this cheap. Mm -hmm. 
With Source games you could easily max out even the most intensive of them with high settings and high resolutions and still see a perfectly playable frame rate, generally well over 60fps until you were in the larger areas that we know these games can suffer with, mostly due to the engine but then again the card does have to take some responsibility. Still we had most things whacked up to high, at least as high as they could go with god rays and all those sort of fancy effects, and it looked brilliant. So higher end performance than a lot of older flagships here from not too long before this architecture initially came out. I mean, I'm talking about the earlier Terra scale stuff, but even then, you're beating those cards with performance all wrapped up in a little hot running package. For emulation we had Wind Waker running on an older performance fork of Dolphin and it ran perfectly fine in 1080p with enhancements. It ran so well in fact that we ended up turning things all the way up to 4K and it still ran perfectly fine with plenty of headroom left over, making this an ideal card for older emulation tasks as you've got so much headroom with this card it was one of the rare instances where the card stayed at reasonable temperatures which was nice to see. You could probably turn things up even higher before you started running into problems, making this an ideal card for emulation tasks. Unfortunately, older games do sometimes have issues with the R7 450, mostly the issue of not recognising it as a real card, and unfortunately limiting settings because of this. Take GTA 4 for example, which oddly enough ran fine, even the frame times weren't too bad, a thing this game can suffer with, but we couldn't turn shadows up from the low settings as the game had artificially limited us. Even if we changed them in the config menu, it would change them back. Still, we saw a great experience, it's just a shame that this card has flown under the radar so much so that there are these odd quirks from the fact that the R7 450 is such a late iteration of the Radian architecture from the era that some games just don't like to work with it very well. Yes, you can go back to the older drivers and they'll be fine, but then you limit yourself to older titles. But still, it'll run, you just have to deal with some quirks. But finally, can it run Crisis? And yes it can, with high settings in a native 1050p resolution we saw things run perfectly fine and look great too. It also pushed our card harder than the Unigine benchmark, with temperatures maxing out here at 94 degrees, which isn't a surprise that Crisis was the most intensive thing we ran on the card yet. But when you realise this is a beefed up HD 7750, it's very impressive to see performance like this running on something so little. It's just a shame that it could do with some slightly better cooling, as this is amazing performance. It's just odd to see such a small card running this hot, when usually these things barely break 70 degrees. But still, Crisis running on something that you can fit in your pocket and spend, you know, five pounds on, that's perfect and really amazing to see. Now I know some people are going to say modded drivers are the way forward here, but unfortunately with the R7 450 they make little to no difference in how things ran. And in my experience compatibility, if you want to run older titles you're better off just running the old drivers that recognise it as a mobile chip, and if you want to run the newer titles you'll just have to deal with some tweaking, but they will run perfectly fine on the final AMD release, just you're not going to be getting anything out of running modded drivers here, and I really thought they would make some degree of improvement. I mean you could argue that they abandoned the card at this point when it was still technically on sale, but there is one major issue from this. It was at this point a 10 year old graphics card just with a fresh name sold solely by OEMs, it wasn't really available to the general market, so it's not really the best argument as it was left with what are for all intents and purposes relatively stable final drivers, even if they are slightly annoying. But still, this must be one of the shortest or longest lived 400 series cards on the market depending on how you look at it. I mean really is it a 400 series card? Personally no, Polaris was a great architecture. Uh, not saying GCN wasn't, but there's a big difference between the two. Uh, at least in terms of power on the high end and low end, so it's amazing that this thing is even keeping up with the 400 series and is in some ways actually deserving of the name given the performance on offer. 
it does boast AMD VCE support, which I've never found to work on a lot of these lower end AMD cards even when they claim they have support for it. But here we are, able to record an entire sample of Half-Life 2 running maxed out all the while the recording was done with high settings on the card, which is a nice little bonus as if you whack this in an old computer, suddenly you can now stream and record, and it's all done on this little AMD unit. It does take some performance away, definitely, but nowhere near as much as it does using an older processor. And for such a small card, that's absolutely brilliant that VCE works. I only used it through OBS, so I don't know how well it works with AMD's Relive or whatever they call it, but it was indistinguishable. Indistinguishable? That's the preset we used. We used the indistinguishable preset and it looked great. So you can actually do some recording and streaming all from the graphics card, which in something this cheap and convenient is fantastic. So where is this card useful? Well I mean for a lot of people wanting a low power card that will run in any age of system, it is ideal. A lot of the newer cards do struggle with older motherboards, but this is AMD's GCN1 running at its peak and it offers tons of compatibility and support all the way back to Windows XP and through onto Windows 10 and 11. I don't think there's hardly any operating systems out there that this thing doesn't support. So you get a decent card for under £15 that you can add to any system and run whatever you want. The fact that most are half height cards means that you could whack this in a HP small form factor PC and run Red Dead Redemption 2 or BeamNG. You can essentially make anything within reason a decent enough gaming PC just by throwing this in there. It's the same mentality as the GTX 750 Ti had years ago, just a lot cheaper. As those 750 Ti's had such a reputation, they are still holding their price today. And these... Well, most people seem to be binning them or throwing them away without realising what they've got. A lot of them are available over on AliExpress for next to nothing, as they've probably been ripped out of old OEM systems. Now, I've worked as a technician for years, and the upgrade cycle on new PCs is around three years or less now, which is why these are now flooding the market. These PCs that they were in are three years old, so they're being recycled. They are ridiculously new, these graphics cards. I've put one in with an AMD Phenom chip, and it's made it run all it needs to. I mean, it's currently playing Empire Earth at 4K, because that's about all this PC is probably going to end up doing, so that's where this card is useful. You can essentially turn anything into a gaming PC for £5. No power requirements, no knowledge needed, you plug it in, download the drivers, and you're good to go. Well, there we have it. AMD's R7 450. And my thoughts? I went into this expecting another OEM rehash of a GCN card. They're usually clocked down, and they're okay if you're on a budget. But they have really pulled off something spectacular here. By beefing up such an old chip, when most variants end up cut down until they're garbage, it's proved AMD's fine wine technology really did peak with the original GCN1, as I don't think anyone expected to see Red Dead Redemption 2, even BeamNG. A lot of people that you know want to play this game on budget systems can't manage to get 30 FPS, and now you can, even with decent settings. And no one really knows these things exist. You just have to watch out for those thermals. It won't ever throttle, but it does run ridiculously hot. It's comical how hot this thing gets. It's GTX 480 byte size. Maybe we could push this thing even more with a better cooler and some more voltages, as this is really GCN's final hurrah. But for now, I hope you've all enjoyed watching the video and finding out more about the R7 450, its weird history, its great performance, its quirks, and the fact it even exists. Thank you very much for watching, and good night. It, it played Red Dead Redemption 2. It's yeah, five. I did go online and visit the casino. Oh, you did go on. Is there a casino? There's there? a casino online. Oh, fuck. Yeah, that's how I got my practice in. Most of my time on Red Dead 1 was spent looking at the casino.